So I was going to call this one Space, the Final Frontier. Because this speaker, the Kef R3, does space like gangbusters. Space, imaging, soundstage, depth, focus. It's a total champ in those regards. It just puts you in into the recording. That's what this is all about. A great imaging speaker like this one just takes you there. It's like virtual reality in audio, except it does it with two channels, no need for five or six or seven or 10 or 11 channels. These two speakers, well, there's another one on the other over there. Uh, these two speakers can create a huge, huge space. And I'm gonna tell you more about that a little later on in this review. But right now, let's just focus on the details of this speaker. First of all, it is the latest version. Well, it's a, well, okay, a lot of new things, sorta, of, kinda. The driver itself, the UniQ driver, this is Kef's 12th generation UniQ. They've been refining it for, for decades, right? Okay, this is the new version of that. Um, when I opened the box, I thought, oh, this is kind of a deja vu experience because I reviewed the predecessor of this speaker, the Kef R300 in 2017. And they look pretty much identical, although according to the specs at least, if you believe in specs, this one weighs five pounds more, same size, same size drivers, but this one weighs five pounds more than the R300 it replaces. So something's going on there. The driver sizes, in case you're wondering, six and a half inches for the woofer, five inch for the UniQ mid-range and one inch for the tweeter. Those are aluminum drivers. This is an aluminum composite woofer, whatever that means. Um, <clears throat> one of the interesting specs though is impedance. The speaker's impedance is rated at eight ohms. That's nice, but nice because it's easy to drive, but it's also has a minimum impedance of 3.2 ohms, which is a little pushing it there, right? So. You need an amplifier that can deliver current. And the easiest way to know if that's gonna happen is it should have a four ohm uh, impedance, a four ohm rating for power. If it doesn't, chances are it's not gonna be a happy combination with the R3 this much, I know for sure. So the cabinet, this one is finished in just scrumptious walnut. It is, I'm not a big fan of walnut. This walnut is really impressive. I don't know how well it's gonna show up in this video, but trust me, it's stunning. And you can get it also, the R3, you can get it in piano black or gloss white, also beautiful. This cabinet, by the way, is super solid. You, it is dense, it weighs 30 pounds. And 30 pounds for a speaker this size is pretty freaking heavy. Round back, there's a port, and uh, there's also bi-wire connections. Every detail of the design that we see here is first rate. I mean, it's a lot of speaker for $2,000. I consider that price pretty reasonable for the quality that this speaker just exudes, you know. Oh, and then it also sounds really good. Beyond the whole spatial thing that I alluded to, it's a very serious high-end speaker. I used some recordings that I was present at during the sessions. It's a, it's a piano trio record with Billy Drummond on drums, Peter Washington on bass, and David Chesky on piano. Now, it was a very crowded session in the control room. It was, it was a different church than Chesky usually records in. So I didn't actually listen in the con quotes in control room in the church. I listened from right near the band, right near the trio. I was either right behind the drums, maybe eight feet away from the drums, behind, directly behind Billy Drummond, or I was in the front listening from the church pews, maybe in the third or fourth row. Now, a few details jump out at me. First thing is, is that the symbols, Billy Drummond was, was, uh, was using different symbols on different uh, tunes, and I had a real sense of that with, the, with these speakers, and just the, the tactile quality of the symbols, they were so, the shimmer was there, the sparkle, just the metallicness of the symbols was shining through the R3. Really, really special. Um, yeah, this is, it, I wasn't expecting to be moved this way from, from these speakers. Uh, now, it's interesting that the bass, uh, Peter Washington's bass at the session, actually, <laughs> it wasn't that clear. I remember thinking, oh, I'm not that far from the bass, and it's big and it's fat and it's got some weight 
at the session and also over these speakers, but in terms of uh, a palpable type of bass, I, I'm not hearing it over the speakers, but you know what? I didn't hear it <laughs> when I was there, so it's not going to be better than the reality of being there. Now, of course, I would always point out when it comes to the sound of recordings is the musicians were a lot closer to the microphone than I was. I was, you know, eight, ten feet away from the mic. So what the mic was picking up and what I was hearing are not the same thing. But the mic and I were in the same room at the same time and I was picking up the, the music from the room itself, this church. So anyway, the, the, this initial uh, listening session with uh, David Chesky's recording here, uh, Oral Paintings is the name of the album, uh, really, it had me shaking my head like this. Yeah, the R3s, they're doing it for me, absolutely. So next up was another Chesky. This is from 1995. And it's a, it's a choral recording with an organ in a church in New York City. And uh, the mic was way up high, different mic than what Chesky uses now. But a stereo microphone, hmm, guessing, uh, I, you know, I don't actually know which mic it was anymore. But it was a stereo microphone. It was the only t that one mic, that one stereo mic was the only mic used for this session to capture the organ and the choir. And uh, you just hear the church, because in this case, the, the mic is relatively far away from the organ and the choir, so it's got to be maybe 10 feet away. Again, I'm, I'm guessing it was a long time ago. So what's being recorded here is the space of the church itself, and that was really a trip because, again, the R3s put me in the church, in that space. You know, it was almost eerie how well it did it. Uh, I will say that as I did at, through these listening sessions, I realized that the toe-in on these speakers significantly changes their, not just their tone, but their spatialness. So I, in the end, I wound up preferring them with virtually no toe-in, because a lot of time I was listening to them with them angled in towards the listening position. But in the end, I, I prefer that more open, spacious sound where they just disappeared uh, when I had them firing straight ahead. And the, the, as for the choir, as for the voices in the choir, just first of all, the recording is extremely dynamic and the R3 handled that with ease. The electronics I used for these listening sessions with the uh, KEF R3 were uh, PassLab's XA25 power amplifier, PassLab's XP30 preamp, the, ter the Denifrep's Terminator DAC, and the Jay's Audio CD Transport Mark II. Um, but the voices on this choral recording were, first of all, first of all were uncompressed. So they just had this, this scope, this scale. And I'm thinking, I'm listening to a, essentially a bookshelf speaker, a stand mount speaker that's just opening up, letting that music, that massive scale of these of the choir and the organ, and the organ is going down, down, down. You just feel it, <laughs> the, the depth of it. Now, in, in real life, yes, the organ went a lot deeper than I'm getting out of these speakers. I've, I felt in my room that the R3s were basically running out of steam around 50 hertz. But the, the, the bass itself, with good recordings, had palpability and speed and texture and just a very uh, present quality to the bass. No thickening, no bloat, no boom, just real vivid, vivid bass. So another recording that I used to change pace entirely was the Flaming Lips version of Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon. Now, if you're a real fan of Dark Side of the Moon and Pink Floyd, you may find this recording disturbing <laughs> because they basically just <laughs> make it their own thing entirely and amp it up. The distortion on this recording, the musical distortion on this recording is intense. It's a, it's, it's a bright sounding recording and the, the R3 wasn't doing anything to tame that brightness. So if you listen to processed bright music and that you find that irritating, then the R3 will maybe too much information for you. That I would be concerned about that. So if you're sensitive to bright and you find that irritating, maybe this isn't so good for you.
Speaking of that, I did spend some time comparing the R3 to the KEF LS50. Now the LS50 been a long-term reference for me. It's a much more laid-back sounding speaker. It's not, it's not as exciting as the R3. So if you want something more relaxed and more basically a warmer tone, yeah, the LS50 would be the way to go. But if you want dynamics, if you want excitement, if you want power and a palpable detail texture sort of sound, the R3 has it hands down over the LS50. The R3 is definitely gets a thumbs up from me. I am very, very, very impressed with this speaker. Everything about it, from the look of it, the build quality, the sound, the imaging, the transparency, the bass, the dynamics with the right amplifier, it's all really, really good. And it's not, it, you know, it's not one of those analytical speakers that kind of hurts your ears to listen to. I found it totally engaging and fun. So, um, yeah, I really, really, really like this speaker. And I think that does it. My name is Steve Guttenberg. This is the Audiophiliac Daily Show, and it does come up, well, now I'm going to say five or six times a week. Uh, if you dig it, please subscribe to this YouTube channel right down there. And uh, if you like what I do and you want more, hey, follow me on Twitter at Audiophiliac Man. You can look at some of my pictures on Instagram at Steve.Guttenberg. Uh, what else? Uh, oh, you can check out my Patreon at P A T R E O N dot com slash <laughs> Audiophiliac. As always, thank you so much for watching. See you next time.